right, good morning. We'll give it a couple minutes for people to pop on. Look at this gorgeous sunrise over here. Good morning. Hello. Gonna give it a couple of minutes for everybody to pop on before we really dive into things. Got my coffee ready, I hope you do too. Um, I need it before y'all start hitting me with the hard questions this morning. So while the historic prison site and National Prisoner of War Museum is closed to the general public right now, we wanted to still give people a chance to visit, even if it's just virtually, and give people a chance to talk with a ranger. Um, so I'm here this morning. Um, I don't know how long this is going to be, so we're this today is kind of like our trial day to test this out, um, see what kind of questions people have about the park, the history of our site. Um, and so we're just here to, to chat. Hello from Maryland. Nice. Um, so yeah, we are just going to talk about an array of different things today. I'm here to answer your questions. I'm here to give you a look around the grounds. We're going to be sticking to the prison site today, um, but if you do have a lot of questions about the cemetery, we can plan for the cemetery um, for next week because we want to try to do this every Saturday. Saturday morning, coffee and whatnot. Um, if you are in Georgia, you know that I'm probably suffering with pine pollen allergies, so just go ahead and forgive me if I have to take a pause. So yes. On your bucket list to visit. I love hearing that, honestly. Anytime a visitor tells me like Andersonville has been on their bucket list, it makes me so happy. Friendsville, Tennessee. Hello, good morning. And it's a beautiful morning. It's a little windy. I don't know if the mic is picking that up or not. Um, but it's gorgeous. The birds are out. The sun is beautiful. Everything. So, yeah. I see a couple of other NPS friends watching. Hello. So, yeah. So, for those of you who have never visited Andersonville. We are the site of one of the Civil War's most notorious prisons. So we're not the only prison in the Civil War. Um, there's about 150 or so, and so we're just one of those 150, but we were the largest prison um, by population, by capacity, out of all of those prisons. And because of that, Andersonville is actually the deadliest ground of the Civil War. Can our cemetery administrator host one of these? I don't know, you might have to talk him into it. Um, I think you have better links with that than I do, Chris. Good morning from Pennsylvania. Hello. Um, so yeah, we're also home to the National Prisoner of War Museum. So when our site was dedicated as a national park unit, um, they also dedicated it to be a memorial to all prisoners of war throughout American history. So we don't just tell the story of Andersonville or of Civil War prisons, but we tell stories of prisoners of war from the Revolutionary War all the way to present day. Um, and so it gives us a really unique opportunity to talk a lot um, about different aspects of American history. So yeah. All right. The Sentinels of Andersonville. That's, yeah, that's actually um, a pretty good piece of historical fiction. There's a lot of good historical fiction about Andersonville, and then there's a lot of, uh, a lot of iffy ones. You know how like Hollywood takes a movie um, and 
does its Hollywood magic. Sometimes authors do the same thing, but um, it's still good. It's still nice to kind of see Andersonville making little pockets of, of books out there. able to um, watch this and kind of see the grounds that their ancestor was on. So yeah, so I'm going to um, take this time to walk around our monument corner a little bit and um, chat about the monuments. If you guys have any questions, feel free to type them up. Um, if I don't know the answer to them right off the bat, because I'm only about four ounces in and it takes me like a good six to seven ounces of coffee to get the brain really going, um, I will look up that answer for you and type it into the chat. Good morning, Mike. How many prisoners actually died at Andersonville? If you want the real number, it's 12,920. So we generally say around 13,000 died um, because they, that's who physically died here on the grounds. That's not counting people who died shortly after they got home because of the conditions in Andersonville or anything like that. Not kind of how we count deaths today, but physically on these grounds, 12,920. Good question. All right. So I don't really know how to flip my camera on Facebook Live. Um, I'm not that technically savvy. So we'll try this. Whenever I give a tour, I really do feed off of people's energy. So um, if you want to use emojis and you know the like, hearts, things like that, that would really encourage me this morning um, of being able to like give a tour with no feedback. So yeah. Hello from South Carolina. Oh, I'm glad that you're a frequent visitor. Hopefully you'll be able to come back. Okay. So again, we're kind of walking around our monument corner. Oh, so the prison, good question, enlisted men are officers. So Andersonville was designed for enlisted men. Officers were held in a separate prison in Georgia. That would have been Camp Oglethorpe, which is in Macon, Georgia. However, officers of USCT regiments were denied their rank. So we do have a major who is imprisoned here um, with enlisted men because they did not recognize him. They didn't recognize his rank um, because he was an officer of um, uh, an African-American regiment. Good questions. So behind me is the Wisconsin Monument. That's the one I was hanging out at earlier. It's our largest monument here um, at Andersonville. Not the most expensive, but it is the largest. I'm going to walk over here to Rhode Island. It opened February 24th, 1864, and officially closed on May 5th, or that's when the last prisoners left, May 5th, 1865. And so, again, in that 14 months, 12,920 died here, um, making it the deadliest ground of the Civil War. So, yeah, trying to catch the questions as they come. Is the site larger than Arlington National Cemetery? I, I can't answer that question. I don't know how big Arlington is. How many Confederate personnel? So at the height of operation, we have about, um, excuse me, again, pine pollen, um, have about 4,000 guards um, in total, and they're the Georgia Reserves. So the first, second, third, fourth Georgia Reserves. And then we have um, other Confederate personnel like doctors on site. Um, I do know there's 15 doctors um, in our hospital, but then that's also not including um, other military personnel kind of like uh, Colonel Parsons, Captain Wirtz, um, Isaiah White. Um, so roughly 4,000 at the height of his operation. The tunnels, yeah. So let's go over to the tree, our fenced in tree here. Okay. 
so here we have a Finston tree. Um, so if you would have visited Andersonville back in the 70s, 80s, you would have seen a lot more wells out here. 63,800 acres. Well, in that case, Andersonville is not as large as Arlington. Our entire park is around 520 acres. Thank you for looking that up. So we have a fenced in well here, and I don't know how well you can see it, um, but we have sort of an indention going into this tree trunk here. Um, there were around 20 to 30 wells that we could still see when the park service took over. Um, those have been capped in, so I'll walk over to a well cap. Now we do have, um, we can take educated guesses that the wells that are really close to the deadline could have been tunnels. Um, we don't have any records to my knowledge of anyone successfully tunneling out of Andersonville as far as escaping. Most successful escapes were while prisoners were on parole or on a work detail, um, much like how prisoners in our system today escape. Um, so not much is different about that. Hold on, I can't, obviously I can't walk and read at the same time. Um, were there some prisoners who remained in the hospital when others were moved out? Yes. So the way they did it, so when, <clears throat> when Sherman captured Atlanta on September 2nd, um, Confederate officials actually thought he was heading to Andersonville. This, this place is not a secret. And there was already a failed liberation attempt of the prison site. So on September 7th, that's when evacuation orders came to evacuate the prison. And what they're doing is they're basically sending prisoners who are well enough to make the train ride to places like Savannah or Camp Lawton. Um, and if they didn't look well enough to make the ride, they did not put them on the train because they didn't want to stop the train to bury those who had passed away. So there are people who are in the hospital. Now, as far as prisoners being here, from the records that we have and what we can see, the longest that a prisoner was here was 10 months. So I have not found a prisoner who was here for all 14 months. So 10 seemed to be the longest that anybody was here. So yeah, I hope that answered that question. So we've got one of our historic well caps. So again, this caps in uh, a well that was dug by prisoners. So the park service capped those in. Fortifications, yes, we do have earthworks around our site. And I can go back to our Wisconsin monument over here to show you one of those earthworks. They are original to our site. So we really try to encourage visitors to not walk on them <laughs> while they're here. Um, we even have crews who um, weed eat the grass so that we're not like riding over them with our lawnmowers because we want to be able to preserve them. So we have earthworks surrounding the site and those come about <clears throat> especially uh, in August of 1864. The artillery that we have here showed up much earlier than that but when we had the failed liberation attempt from Stoneman's raid um, that's when you see this call. They actually put a newspaper ad in surrounding newspapers asking for more slaves to be sent to Andersonville to build these fortifications. So yeah. Oh, you're welcome. I love doing this. Well, I love talking about Andersonville. I don't know so much about being on camera. Okay. So we're heading over to our earthwork over here. Yes. So there is a rebuilt section of the prison site and we'll take a walk down there too to give you all a look at that we have two reconstructions we couldn't reconstruct the entire prison that's a lot to maintain okay so here are our earthworks so you can see the earthwork here a little hump and then we have our artillery um, behind it. So our guards are actually camped back here. So they're camped sort of in the northwest corner of the prison site when they first arrived here at Andersonville. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually a line of earthworks right in front of these trees here. Um, you have to have a good eye. Whenever I point them out to students on field trips, I'm just going to
nutshell because there's so much history surrounding it. There's a lot of history surrounding um, the prison itself during the Civil War. There's a ton of history for post-war Andersonville. Um, we are actually uh, in the 50th anniversary of us being a national park. And so, um, again, the history here is just incredible. Great way to start your day. Well, thank you. designed that monument and built it. Um, also designed the Ohio monuments at Chickamauga, Chattanooga, um, and Shiloh. How many kids do you need to schedule a field trip? Um, so for our homeschool groups, um, you really just indicate on the registration form that you're a homeschool group. I know sometimes it's hard to get students together. We've had homeschool groups as big as um, like 20 and then as small as five. Um, so again, you just indicate that on your form. So that way we know, um, you know, kind of what we're looking forward to because a lot of times homeschool groups are also mixed grades and we want to make sure that we are hitting state standards for those grades. So these trees, um, you know, I don't believe there's any witness trees around here because this land would have been cleared out for another half mile to mile around it. We know this because there are earthworks back in those trees as well. Um, and that would make it harder for prisoners to escape the more land you clear out. And before this was an open field, it was a forested land. Um, so they did take down all the trees. In fact, the first prisoners who come here from Richmond, Virginia, they call it almost a paradise because they are left with the debris, essentially. So the tree limbs, the tree roots, all of that stuff to build their shelters with because they're not giving any supplies to build with. Okay, so here's our reconstructed north gate here. So it is exactly where the original north gate was located. I don't know if y'all saw our archaeology post from a couple of weeks ago, um, but they did a dig here in the um, late 70s, early 80s, um, and then some more digs in the 80s as well to find the original site. The original wood from the prison was still preserved in the ground, even though the tops had uh, rotted away, been burned away, been torn down, different things like that. So we were able to find the original location. Yes, so this location for our prison, it was picked for several different reasons. One, because we're away from Union lines. And two, because the original, original location they had chosen, um, they weren't able to get the land. So they initially wanted it to be in Albany, Georgia, near the Radium Springs area. Um, but they got, got, got into some snags. And so then they came to Andersonville. Oh, this is a beautiful shot. I don't want to miss it. They came to Andersonville and um, the landowner, Benjamin Dykes, and the landowner of what is now the National Cemetery, Wesley Turner, uh, they rented their land to the Confederate government for this operation. And so they were able to acquire the land. And it happened to have a water source. It was next to a railroad. So it really checked all of the boxes. Um, but a lot of people, especially historians, wonder why they didn't build the prison just like a quarter of a mile further south and use Sweetwater Creek. And that's simply because they couldn't acquire the land. Um, you shouldn't commandeer land <laughs> and, and just claim it. I say shouldn't because that is American history in a nutshell. Um, and especially early American history. So they, they are trying to use um, proper channels for acquiring land back then. So yeah. Do they allow organized digs anymore? No, the Park Service does not dig. We do ground penetrating radar. 
And so um, they essentially scan the ground now to look for anomalies. Um, we had SIAC out here to doing a um, three-year project scanning the ground of the historic prison site um, to look for those different anomalies. And then um, it's so accurate, the images can come back and kind of tell you what's in the ground, so there's no, there's no need for a dig anymore. So yeah. Again, beautiful day out here. So here we are walking into the gates. Uh, so take a minute to kind of put yourself into the mind of a prisoner, right? Like this a prison was initially built for 10,000 people. They said that a third of the stream would be able to provide fresh water for 10,000. If you are arriving here at the end of May, so it opens in February, by the end of May, 1864, they've surpassed that 10,000 mark. And then they expand the prison in July. By August, we reach our 33,000 peak. So imagine these doors shut. You're standing here in the bullpen area. You've got your, your guard tower. So you have your guards towering over you here. Imagine what 33,000 people sound like. I can give you a bit of an idea of that. I went to a Foo Fighters concert at Turner Field in Atlanta. And at one point they had like no music playing, no nothing. And so it was just 32,000 people talking. And that gave me an idea of what Andersonville must have sounded like. Um, and so again, here. And so give you a visual to that sound of just 33,000 people chattering. Um, is this image here. I don't know how well you can see it, but we post it a lot. Um, you actually see the ration cart here and then all these men. So this is taken on August 17th, 1864 by A.J. Riddle, who was a photographer from Macon, Georgia. And it's just incredible to see just how crowded Andersonville was. Okay, no sound. Does that mean you can't hear me or? Just making sure technology is working. Okay. So again, just kind of like walking in here and seeing a massive amount of people it must have been extremely overwhelming to those prisoners entering here in the summer of 1864. Okay, perfect. So to get like a topography layout here, this is the original 16 and a half acres we're looking at. And it is in between two hills. And we have our, our water source kind of down the stream. Uh, not a very good water source. And so anytime it rains, that water is just rushing down these hills. And I'm gonna to try to see if I can get you a good image of this extreme hillside here that prisoners had to try to essentially pitch their tent on. So again, it's an extreme dip over there. So this is actually about five acres of unlivable space because with 33,000 people using the same water source, it being in between two hills, I mean, it floods anytime we get a good rain. Um, so that really shrinks our prison site. Plus, inside we have a deadline, and so we have kind of like a no man's land area. Let's see if you can see that behind me. Um, there we go. So, our deadline here. So, that space, that 15 foot space, the no man's land, is that shrinks the prison again. What was Claire Barton's role at the prison? Yes, there is a monument for her, and that was her role in helping to establish the National Cemetery after the down with James Moore and company and Dorrance Atwater who was a former prisoner who kept a death registry and so she came down with them in July and August of 1865 um, as they were establishing the cemetery. 
So the prison itself, so just the stockade, was a total of 26 and a half acres. We're here at Providence Spring. Was the original acreage farmed any time after the war? Yes. So freedmen moved on site after the war and they tried to um, build their first homes here. They tried to farm bits of it. In fact, during I think one of the excavations, they found um, skeletal remains and it turned out to be a cow where part of the stockade wall had fallen on top of the cow um, and killed it. Um, so it wasn't human remains. And so we can um, take an educated guess from that, that they might have even tried to do some cattle farming here. Reminds you of Gettysburg. Yeah, Gettysburg is very peaceful. Again, we have our north gate here. Okay, we'll head back up to the monument corner. Yes, the town of Andersonville was here when the prison was active. It had a population of about 20 people. And so again, that's one of the reasons why they chose this location. There was already an established um, train depot there. There were store warehouses where they can store commissary goods. Um, they had a blacksmith in the area. So the town was kind of one of the reasons why they chose the site. How many monuments? There are 24 monuments in the park. Not all of them are here on the prison site. Some are out in the National Cemetery as well. Any other archaeology done on site? Um, there was a couple of digs. Again, they all happened in like the 70s and 80s. Um, but right now, it's just all ground penetrating radar. And uh, the last time they did that was in 2018, I believe. If it sounds like I'm out of breath, it's because I am. I'm walking up this hill here. The wooden wall is not original, no. So the original wall, bits of it rotted away, bits of it were torn down by the freedmen who moved on site. They built some of their first houses out of it. And then in um, 1869, the rest of it was burned down. What book? If we had to read a book. Um, I personally like Ovid Futch's uh, History of Andersonville Prison. He uses almost all primary sources in his book, which is something you really need to look out for for Andersonville. Um, it's a bit dry. It reads like a 1960s history textbook, mainly because it was written in the 1960s. Um, but again, it just is so good um, as far as like getting a true history of the prison here. How many natural springs? Um, so just Providence Spring. Right now is the only natural spring that we can see. But again, we have um, Stockade Creek that is still flowing. So yeah, I did want to bring you to the Michigan Monument though. It's got a really um, interesting backstory about its location. Oh, ground penetrating radar, yes. So. We had a project with SEAC, um, the Southeast Archaeological Center, um, who works with Park Service uh, across the United States. And we had a project to scan the entire prison site just to see, you know, what could be found essentially. And um, if we're back up and running in June, <laughs> which I don't know if we are, I can't answer that question, uh, SEAC was going to come and do a program about what they found during those scans. So we will. Um, re 
kind of schedule that program so that we can still offer that to visitors and they can talk about what SEAC actually found during their scans of the site. So yeah. So behind me is the Michigan Monument. And it's really interesting as far of as like the location of the monument. So Andersonville survivors made up the commission to design and commission this monument. And when they visited the prison and cemetery to pick the location, um, the six of them <laughs> looked around the prison site and picked a spot that was equidistant from each of their campsites. And so that's why the Michigan Monument is in this particular location. Um, they said it was 50 feet south and 50 feet east from their campsite. So again, it was equidistant from where those men camped. So yeah. If you come to visit Andersonville, um, we are free. So there's no cost to visit our park. We are closed to the public per recommendations of the CDC and Georgia Department of Health. But the cemetery, the National Cemetery, is open for public visitation. So good questions. Yes, um, chief causes of death. Yeah, so chronic diarrhea is number one which is very ironic. So I don't know if you can see it, see if I can get it, aha. There's a warehouse somewhere right in here that mines kaolin, and kaolin is found in Pepto-Bismol and kaopeptate, and chronic diarrhea is the number one cause of death here at Andersonville, and they're camping on one of the richest kaolin mines in the United States. Um, of course, they don't know what kaolin is at the time. Um, but yeah, so chronic diarrhea is number one, scurvy is number two because of the lack of vegetables in their diet, and then dysentery is number three cause of death. So those three causes alone kill over half of those who died here at Andersonville. So yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, if you have a visitor, or a visitor, if you have an ancestor who was at Andersonville, we do keep a database. Of the 45,000 who are here, we have the names of about 40,000 of them. Um, so you can always check in to the park and kind of see if we have their names. And if not, we can walk you through on how to get their military service records. The prisoner gang that was hanged, yes. So that was the Raiders. And a book actually just came out this month about them. Um, the Andersonville Raiders by uh, Gary Morgan. It just came out. Um, they were a recipient of our POW grant and did extensive research on who the Raiders were, on their trial, on the regulators, which were supposed to be like this police force inside the prison site. Um, but the Raiders have like a very sort of short-lived story. We see them um, first kind of uprising in April of 1864 and getting like really bold and heavy in May and June of 65. And so these were a gang of about 75, 100 prisoners who didn't mind like stealing and beating and killing fellow prisoners for a leg up in the prison. And so the prisoners um, petitioned Wirtz uh, to ask to do something about it. So Wirtz took these prisoners and held them outside the prison um, until they kind of could figure out what to do with them. So we, we, I say we, they uh, held a trial for the six ringleaders. The rest of the raiders had to run a gauntlet. So the trial found the six ringleaders to be guilty and they were hanged on July 11th, 1864 and buried separately from all of the other prisoners. Now initially their graves were left unmarked. So once they were buried, the prisoners themselves, because it's union burying union here, uh, it's union prisoners on a work detail burying prisoners. So they decided to bury these raiders away from the rest of the prisoners. They didn't deem them worthy enough to bury them next to um, the prisoners they essentially thieved from and did not mark their graves. So they didn't get names until James Moore and company come down. And um, we don't decorate their graves on 
uh, holidays. So they don't get a wreath for Greece across America. They don't get a flag for Memorial Day. Um, because again, we are honoring um, the decisions of the prisoners real time. So they were hanged by the prisoners themselves. So this trial was held by the prisoners. Um, they were executed by prisoners. So this was not something that the Confederates did that comes up in the Wartz trial. And even um, then they were just kind of like, this was our way of maintaining control within the prison site because the Confederacy was not maintaining that control. So good question. So yeah. Oh, pollen people, it's a lot. Any Union Army officers confined at Andersonville? Uh, officers of USCT regiments, so United States Colored Troops, they were denied their rank. Um, so they were held here. So our highest ranking person in here is a major. And um, I think his last name was Bogle. Major Archibald Bogle. Um, and he tried while he was in here to have his rank recognized so that he could go to an officer's prison. And the officer's prison in Georgia here is Camp Oglethorpe in Macon. Doesn't exist anymore. Um, I think there's a historical marker there, but that's about it. So yeah, so I'll take a few more questions before we wrap this up. Um, and then I'll be back next Saturday. And let me know um, kind of what you wanna see from me next Saturday. If you want to see more of this prison site, if you want to do the cemetery, just kind of let me know. Um, this is a virtual visit for all of you. So I just want to make sure that you're getting your fill of history in Andersonville. So was Henry Wards as bad as a commandant as history says he is? I encourage you to read all 830 something pages of his trial <laughs> and and come up with that um, I've read his trial twice over there's some things I agree with there's some things I don't agree with I'm not a legal expert um, I would love to get um, someone who is well versed in military tribunals to read over it um, but I, I don't know in my in my personal opinion um, even reading Wurtz's statement from himself and reading his personal papers. Um, in 1862 or 63, he even writes that he's gonna be hanged for the way that he treats prisoners of war. So before Andersonville was even in existence or a thought, Wurtz kind of knew he wasn't uh, the best. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of reading all of that but I would definitely encourage you to, to read his trial. It's online. The whole thing is published online. Um, if you don't want to read the entire thing online, we tweeted it. And so you can just go to Twitter and type in the hashtag Wartz trial and kind of read it in tweetable bits. So, yeah. So, and then Wartz was tr uh, charged alongside five other people. So we have to remember that too. a lot of comments coming in. When was the prison site turned into a national park? So that was 1970. So after the prison closed, it went back to private ownership. The owner sold it to the GAR, who then turned it over to Women's Relief Corps in 1896. So it has been a memorialized prison park since 1896 and then turned into Andersonville National Historic Site in 1970. Um, so yeah, we've been a memorialized site for a really long time, but a national park for 50 years. Good question. Prison site and museum is closed, but the cemetery is open. Yes. I hope you get to come, Brian, um, whenever we reopen fully. So yeah. The five people who were charged, no, they weren't found guilty for murder. Um, so they weren't hanged. One of the common misconceptions is that Wurtz was the only person hanged for war crimes during the Civil War, and that's not true either. Um, we actually have a, a portion of our website. If you want to go on there, I'll drop the link if I remember. That talks about all the myths of Andersonville, and that's one of the myths. Cemetery next Saturday. I feel like that's a general consensus, so I can do cemetery. How many POWs are buried in the cemetery? That's a really good question. Um, I know how many from Andersonville are there, but we do have um, POWs from other wars buried there, and I don't know the answer to that, so I'll try to find that out for you. So, yeah. All right, well, I am going to sign off, finish my coffee. I'll read through the comments and try to post some answers to the ones um, that I've missed. And... 
y'all next Saturday, 10 a.m. I'm excited. We'll do the cemetery.